Good morning, everybody. We are delighted that you're able to join us this morning for worship and so grateful that under such difficult circumstances, as many people as uh, are able to come with us and be with us at this time are doing so. Uh, trying a different experiment today, trying to, so much of what we do now is experimental, trying to uh, record our, our worship opportunity live uh, in our sanctuary. Um, nobody's here with me. The piano that you heard, uh, delightfully played by Karen, was recorded and sent in to us um, all by myself in a building that holds upwards of 400 people, but we're trying different things to make worship as meaningful for you as possible. In this regard, I want to remind you that our worship opportunities and devotions are available to you on Facebook. Our Facebook page is uh, Facebook backslash incarnation.lutheran. Uh, we also have our worship opportunities recorded and available to you on our YouTube channel, which is ILC Servants, uh, as well as, of course, on our website, www.godamongus. It is important to know that all of these things are free services. You don't have to pay for anything. Just sign up, get yourself on, and get connected so that we might be connected with you. Uh, by way of reminder as well, worship opportunities at our church now include a 10 a.m. worship service on Sunday mornings, which is what you're participating in now, Nine, uh, rather 7 p.m. devotional time, which is Monday to Friday. We're going to try to keep that up Monday to Friday, and my hope is we'll keep that up even after the sanctuary reopens. We don't know when that will be, but we're hopeful to keep uh, at least this portion of a new thing going for us. Uh, online check-in with ministry staff. Pastor Tim has been essentially doing that for a time, but all of us are going to participate, Deacon Mindy and myself as well. The uh, check-in time is at 2 p.m. Monday to Friday as well. So devotions Monday to Saturday, 7 p.m. Online check-in Monday to Friday at 2 p.m. And worship on Sunday at 10 a.m. So please keep those things in mind and join us when you can. Um, we're doing something again differently today. And that is providing for you an outline of our worship, which includes the major pieces, for example, the brief order for confession and forgiveness, all of the readings in their entirety. It has also the, uh, the words to the hymns, etc., so that you can follow along our worship service just as if you were here in the sanctuary looking up at the screens. Now, there, there's a link for that information that is on Facebook, that's on, on the webpage. I hope most of you will have found it. Um, if you haven't, don't panic. We'll be doing this again next week uh, until we all get it right and then we all learn how to best do this so that you can follow along and worship and participate. One of the things that I'm hoping that you'll do is sing along. Now, uh, most of you don't know this, but I sing very, very loudly, but only when I'm alone or only when nobody can hear me. So if any of you have the same problem that I have and are afraid to sing when you think other people might hear you, let it loose, because if you're home by yourself, if you're home alone, sing to God's glory, because this is the moment to do it. Finally, by way of announcement, I'd like to really express profound thanks to the people who have helped out here at the church, not just volunteers, but especially our musicians. Uh, people have been working hard to try to figure out ways for us to bring worship to you, recording music at home, coming into the sanctuary when nobody else is here to record music on the organ and so forth. So I want to thank Karen Zajak, our Saturday evening pianist and music musician, uh, music rather performer, who's been with us for many, many years and delighted us at our Saturday evening services, is now providing and has provided for us the prelude for today. Uh, Dr. John Naples, our organist, a very accomplished uh, musician who uh, does wonderful things on our instrument, and we're delighted that he continues to help us as best he can in this very, very difficult time. Uh, the band revived uh, for our contemporary service, which I've long said is one of the better bands, frankly, in the Pacifica Synod and possibly in the ALCA, just a delight to listen to. They have continued to put together for us beautiful music for us to use during our worship times in our time of uh, isolation. Now, just so that you know, being a band is a challenge because people have to work together, but being a band when you can't be together in the same room is profoundly difficult. So we're grateful to Scott and all of the members of the band who have, who have put this together. So thank you, thank you, thank you to all our musicians. Thank you especially also to Scott whose uh, uh, artistry on the internet and on technology has enabled us to continue to do the things that we're doing. So thank you to all those people. They've been a blessing to us and a blessing to you, I'm sure, as well. With that then, I'd like to begin our worship this morning. We'll begin with a brief order for confession and forgiveness. 
We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us now confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The first reading for today comes to us from the book of the prophet Ezekiel reading from the 37th chapter all the way through to the 14th. Ezekiel 37, 1 to 14. God grabbed me. God's spirit took me up and set me down in the middle of an open plain strewn with bones. He led me around and among them a lot of bones. There were bones all over the plain, dry bones bleached by the sun. He said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Master God, only you know that. He said to me, Prophesy over these bones. Dry bones, listen to the message of God. God the Master told the dry bones, Watch this. I'm bringing the breath of life to you, and you'll come to life. I'll attach sinews to you, put meat on your bones, cover you with skin, and breathe life into you. You'll come alive and you'll realize that I am God. I prophesied just as I'd been commanded. As I prophesied, there was a sound, oh, rustling. The bones moved and came together bone to bone. I kept watching. Sinews formed, then muscles on the bone, then skin stretched over them but they had no breath in them. He said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, tell the breath, God the master says, come from the four winds. Come, breath. Breathe on these slain bodies. Breathe life. So I prophesied just as he commanded me. The breath entered them and they came alive. They stood up on their feet, a huge army. Then God said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Listen to what they're saying. Our bones are dried up. Our hope is gone. There's nothing left of us. Therefore, prophesy, tell them, God the Master says, I'll dig up your graves and bring you out alive, O my people. I'll take you straight to the land of Israel. When I dig up graves and bring you out as my people, you'll realize that I am God. I'll breathe my life into you, and you'll live. Then I'll lead you straight back to your land, and you'll realize that I am God. I've said I'll do it, and I'll do it. God's decree. The second lesson for today comes to us from Paul's epistle to the Romans, reading from the 8th chapter, beginning with the 5th verse. Those who think they can do it on their own end up obsessed with measuring their own moral muscle, but never get around to exercising it in real life. But those who trust in God's action in them find that God's Spirit is in them, living and breathing God. 
Obsession with self in these matters is a dead end. Attention to God leads us out into the open, into a spacious, free life. Focusing on the self is the opposite of focusing on God. Anyone completely absorbed in self ignores God, ends up thinking more about self than God. That person ignores God, who God is and what he's doing. And God isn't pleased at being ignored. But if God himself has taken up residence in your life, you can hardly be thinking more of yourself than of him. Anyone, of course, who has not welcomed this invisible but clearly present God, the Spirit of Christ, won't know what we're talking about. But for you who welcome him, in whom he dwells, even though you still experience the limitations of sin, you yourself experience life on God's terms. It stands to reason, doesn't it, that if the alive and present God who raised Jesus from the dead moves into your life, he'll do the same thing in you that he did in Jesus, bringing you alive to himself. When God lives and breathes in you, and he does, as surely as he did in Jesus, you are delivered from that dead life. With his spirit living in you, your body will be as alive as Christ's. gospel that's been chosen for the fifth Sunday in Lent is the gospel I'm about to read to you. It's from the gospel of John, reading from the 11th chapter, beginning with the first verse. A man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. This was the same Mary who massaged the Lord's feet with aromatic oils and then wiped them with her hair. It was her brother Lazarus who was sick. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Master, the one you love so very much is sick. When Jesus got the message, he said, This sickness is not fatal. It will become an occasion to show God's glory by glorifying God's Son. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. But oddly, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed on where he was for two more days. After two days, he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. He said, Rabbi, you can't do that. The Jews are out to kill you and you're going back? Jesus replied, are there not 12 hours of daylight? 
Anyone who walks in the daylight doesn't stumble because there's plenty of light from the sun. Walking at night, he might very well stumble because he can't see where he's going. He said these things and then announced, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. I'm going to wake him up. The disciples said, Master, if he's gone to sleep, he'll get a good rest and wake up feeling fine. Jesus was talking about death, while his disciples thought he was take, talking about taking a nap. Then Jesus became explicit. Lazarus died. And I'm glad for your sakes that I wasn't there. You're about to be given new grounds for believing. Now let's go to him. That's when Thomas, the one called the twin, said to his companions, Come along, we might as well die with him. When Jesus finally got there, he found Lazarus already four days dead. Bethany was near Jerusalem, only a couple of miles away, and many of the Jews were visiting Martha and Mary, sympathizing with them over their brother. Martha heard Jesus was coming and went out to meet him. Mary remained in the house. Martha said, Master, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask God, he will give you. Jesus said, your brother will be raised up. Martha replied, I know he'll be raised up in the resurrection at the end of time. You don't have to wait for the end. I am, right now, resurrection and life. The one who believes in me, even though he or she dies, will live. And everyone who lives, believing in me, does not ultimately die at all. Do you believe this? Yes, Master, all along I have believed that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who comes into the world. After saying this, she went to her sister Mary and whispered in her ear, The teacher is here and is asking for you. The moment she heard that, she jumped up and ran out to him. Jesus had not yet entered the town, but still at the place where Martha had met him. When her sympathizing Jewish friends saw Mary run off, they followed her, thinking she was on her way to the tomb to weep there. Mary came to where Jesus was waiting and fell at his feet, saying, Master, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her sobbing and the Jews with her sobbing, A deep anger welled up within him. He said, where did you put him? Master, come and see, they said. Now Jesus wept. The Jews said, look how deeply he loved him. Others among them said, well, if he loved him so much, why didn't he do something to keep him from dying? After all, he opened the eyes of a blind man. Then Jesus, the anger again welling up within him, arrived at the tomb. It was a simple cave in the hillside with a slab of stone laid against it. Jesus said, remove the stone. The sister of the dead man, Martha, said, Master, by this time there's a stench. He's been dead four days. Jesus looked her in the eye. Didn't I tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God... Then to the others, go ahead, take away the stone. They removed the stone. Jesus raised his eyes to heaven and prayed. Father, I'm grateful that you've listened to me. I know you always do listen. But on account of this crowd standing here, I've spoken so that they might believe that you sent me. Then he shouted, Lazarus, come out. And he came out a cadaver, wrapped from head to toe with a kerchief over his face. Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him loose. That was a turnaround for many of the Jews who were with Mary. They saw what Jesus did and believed in him. But some went back to the Pharisees and told on Jesus. The high priests and Pharisees called a meeting of the Jewish ruling body. What do we do now, they ask. This man keeps on doing things, creating God signs. If we let him go on, pretty soon everyone will be believing in him, and the Romans 
will come and remove what power and privilege we still have. A long text on the fifth Sunday in Lent that is kind of an unusual one, and I'm going to describe to you why it's unusual. This text appears right before Palm Sunday, the, the Sunday, which is next Sunday, that we celebrate Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem that is marked by the palms waving and all of the, the furor, hallelujah, and, and praise to the Lord and so forth that people shouted as Jesus came into the, into the village. But this day, we hear of the raising of Lazarus. It is important, I think, that we recognize some of the distinctions that are in the Gospel of John, some of the things in the Gospel of John that are decidedly different from the other texts. You know, you, you all know, that we have basically four Gospels available to us. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There are apocalyptic and other sorts of Gospels that don't fit in the canon of Scripture, but these four are ours, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and John is a bit different. The first three are called synoptic gospels. That means they have the same vision, the same view. You can tell in looking at them that they're based on the same materials. They have the same source material, and therefore the stories, though from different perspectives, are substantially the same. They're the same story being told and retold from different perspectives. But this gospel, the Gospel of John, is very different. It was written probably some decades after the first three and was written by a community of people that had escaped and isolated themselves from the community at large. It was written by a group of people that wanted to live holy lives, that wanted to follow what the Master taught, that wanted to be the people that God called them to be. And they were concerned now, more than anything else, about some of the ideas, the false ideas, the heresies that were dancing about. And they wanted to proclaim a message that said that this man, Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, was the son of the living God. And so the gospel was written. Now, there are several marks of this gospel that we can describe, but let me say this first, that in the other gospels, Mark and Luke particularly, Mark 11 and Luke 19, the one story that sets off everybody, the one story that sets off the, the leaders of the Jews and therefore eventually the Romans, to try to seek to condemn Jesus to death was the story of the cleansing of the temple. You know where Jesus goes in and finds the animals and the money changers and he sees all the commerce that's going on and it's corruption and he goes in there and turns over the tables and makes a whip out of cords and chases them all out? In those texts, in Mark 11 and Luke 19, we see the beginning of this plot to kill the Lord. That plot in the Gospel of John begins with this story. Now this story takes place at a very different kind of circumstance. This story is unique to the Gospel of John. The raising of Lazarus doesn't appear anywhere else. And in Mark 11 and Luke 19, where we hear the story of the cleansing of the temple, that story is retold in the Gospel of John right at the beginning. In John chapter 2, we hear of the story of the uh, changing of the water into wine at the wedding feast in Canaan of Galilee. As I tell these things, listening about all these different places, I remember the time that many of us shared there a year and a half ago in, in, in Israel and Palestine and seeing the big jugs on the ground and, and being in the place and celebrating the sacrament with wine that was made in Cana of Galilee. These are things hard to forget. But in any case, in the gospel, right after that, the disciples of Jesus, after this wedding feast, went back to Capernaum to rest. And after they rested in some days, they went down to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, which was a custom in the springtime of the year. That's when they were going to do it. And that's when, right after the wedding feast in Cana of Galilee, that Jesus cleansed the temple. And that had nothing to do with the reasons for his condemnation in this gospel. The reason that Jesus was condemned, the reason that people were plotting to condemn Jesus to death, was because he raised Lazarus from the dead. That is a very different kind of view that John is putting forward than the other Gospels. Moreover, the Gospel of John has as, it, as its base something very unusual. 
we have a methodology in John that involves Jesus providing a sign, doing something. And this is the last of Jesus' signs before he moves towards his death. Jesus does something, and then there is a dialogue, people chatting about it, usually his disciples getting some information about what just happened. And then there's a discourse, Jesus interpreting what the, what the passage meant, what the act meant, what the sign was. But in this case, the dialogue and the interpretation occurred before the sign. Jesus is having a chat with his disciples before they get to Bethany, telling them that Lazarus has died, telling them what he's about to do, and telling them what it means. Why does Jesus do all this? Well, I'm convinced he does it for a very specific reason. You see, we have a tendency to put things together that we can't tear apart. I do it all the time. Is it easy for you, for example, to think of salt and pepper apart? There is salt and there is pepper, but usually, in our culture at least, we think of salt and pepper together. There are things that just go together. I remember when I was on my way home from India after my second trip there. It was, a, it was a marvelous trip on the one hand, but difficult on the other. Marvelous because I got to go and live in a place for 18 months and learn a new language and learn a new culture and learn about a huge world religion. All of these things, wonderful, wonderful gifts. But there were some tough things there as well. First, I got yellow jaundice, a hepatitis A, a sickness that was, man, it wasn't good. And I don't really want to talk about that anymore, but it was a bad time. Addition, in addition to that, it was the beginning of the first Gulf War, and, and that was a tense time. We were actually counseled by the State Department to leave. Um, and I was actually threatened by a group of young men once who chased me. Fortunately, I was 35 years younger and I had a bicycle. There were tough times, but the least, and, uh, the, the least problem that I had, but perhaps the most challenging, was this. During that period that I was there, the airline that I'd flown into the country on had gone bankrupt. It's called Pan Am. Some of you will remember that airline. It went bankrupt and they told me that they were gonna get me home no matter what. I had a guarantee that I would get home, so I didn't obsess over it, but I, it was in the back of my mind. And I did not find out until the very last week what the routing was gonna be, and it was awful. They managed to take a 14 to 16 hour trip and turn it into 40 hours. And I was to fly through a myriad of airports. I started in Kathmandu, Nepal, to Varanasi, India, to New Delhi, to Frankfurt, to London, to JFK, to San Francisco, to Seattle, to Vancouver, to Calgary, to Winnipeg, which is where I was ultimately headed. I tried to change it, I tried everything I could, but because I was on so many different airlines, and they all had given these coupons as a courtesy to Pan Am somehow, I had no choice. So I resigned myself to the trip and realized that I had to do the best I could. And I knew that I had a bit of a layover in London Heathrow. And so I was focusing on London Heathrow. What could I do there that would give me joy? What could I do there that would be interesting? And I decided what it was. I'd been living in India for 18 months, essentially on a vegetarian diet. I was going to go to England and have fish and chips. Of course I was going to have fish and chips. And so I was focused on that. When I arrived in Varanasi, I was thinking about fish and chips. When I arrived in Delhi, when I arrived in Frankfurt, when I arrived in London, I was focused on fish and chips and I was going for them. Well, it took me a little time, but I finally found a kiosk or a little restaurant in the, in the terminal that was serving fish and chips. And there was like four queues of people waiting to give their orders. And just as I got up to the order, there was a lady that was a little ways beside me giving her order as well. And I said, I'll have two piece fish and chips. Now that's significant because a piece of fish and chips there, the the fish was the size of a small boat, but I was hungry. So I wanted two piece fish and chips. And at the moment that I uttered those words, the lady beside me, I'll have fish and salad. And it just sounded so incongruous. It, it didn't make any sense to be fish and salad. And ironically, the people who were the servers, they heard the same thing that I did. And everybody turned and looked at her and said, fish and salad. And she said, yes, Caesar salad, if you please. Nothing wrong 
with fish and salad, nothing at all. But keep in mind, this was 30 years ago, and no one had ever uttered those two words together at the same time prior to that. Fish and salad? I'm sure she enjoyed her fish and salad as I did my fish and chips. But somehow or other, in that moment in time, it didn't make sense. In our gospel lesson today, Jesus utters something that they didn't get. He says to them, I am the resurrection and the life. And they didn't catch it. Sometimes the combinations were so fixed on what they mean, we don't think more deeply. In fact, this set of words, when Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life, this set of words in many manuscripts, ancient manuscripts, was omitted because there was an assumption that, well, that's just a redundancy. He didn't mean to say both things, or the, the gospel writer didn't necessarily need to put both in. But I am convinced that there was a dual meaning here, because Jesus is talking not about the resurrection at the end of time. That was Mar Martha's mistake. That's what she thought he was talking about. Jesus is talking about life right now, right here. That when we, embrace, when we embrace Jesus, the Son of the living God, we have life now. We have life in the here and the now. This lesson for us at Lent, this lesson for us commemorating and thinking about Lent in these particular circumstances where the whole world is under threat because of the coronavirus. These words are important for us to remember. Resurrection, as we think about it, and we're going to be talking about that a lot in coming weeks. Next Sunday, of course, being Passion Sunday or Palm Sunday. The Sunday after being Easter, we're going to be talking about what it means that Jesus, the Son of the living God, was killed by us, killed by our sins, and then that he rose from the dead. What does that mean? And how does it apply to us? And we're going to be talking about not just Jesus' resurrection, but our own. But the God life, the resurrected life, that doesn't begin at the end, brothers and sisters. That's here right now. It's here for you. Whenever there is challenge and difficulty, whenever the woes of sin overwhelm us and overtake us, and we do not know how to live. We have God. We have God in our lives, alive in us right now. Death is no longer a part of the equation. Suffering is no longer a part of the equation. Yes, those things that are limitations of sin still befuddle us and befall us. But in the ultimate context, we are saved by grace through faith. It is my prayer for you this day, as you reflect on what it is that God has done for you in Christ Jesus, you remember this, that Jesus is the resurrection, and that because of what Jesus has done for us, we will have eternal life. But more importantly, brothers and sisters, especially now, in the face of the fear that all of us feel, you need to know this, Jesus is the resurrection, but Jesus is the resurrection and the life right now. So wherever you are, whatever you're doing, think about this Jesus who's done everything for you so that you might have life. And whatever the challenge you're living in, whatever the circumstance that is messing with you, you're alive in Christ. We're all alive in Christ. Let's pray. Good, gracious, and merciful Lord, we give you thanks that in the face of all the challenges, in the face of all the fear, we can know that you're present to us. Help us to embrace your presence. Help us to know it more clearly than anything else, so that even in the face of restrictions and limitations, we might reach out as your servants to those around us who are afraid, those around us who don't know your presence, those around us who are suffering. Help us to be, especially now, Lord, your hands and feet in the world. Help us to know that you're with us and help us to share that you're with everyone. In your name we pray. Amen. At this time, I would like to... Uh,
remind people of a couple things. First of all, if you would wish to make an offering, a donation, you can do so online. There are a multitude of ways to do that. Um, we have buttons on the, on the website that will give you instructions on how to do that. Um, you can mail in a check. We have e-offering that people can set up as they wish. So please remember to do that because your church continues to need to do the God's work in the world. Um, at this time and during the playing of the next song, and while people are working to provide their offering to the church, I'd like to invite you in the, um, the little comment section at the bottom here uh, to share the peace, to share God's peace with people. It is important that we remain connected. And in this time of isolation and in this time of separation, I invite you to share God's peace with one another in the comment section at the bottom of the Facebook page. And so I wish all of you, brothers and sisters, the peace of the Lord which passes all understanding. Amen. I'd like to invite you all in uh, 
together with me and join us in confessing our common faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Join me in prayer. Gracious and all-powerful Lord, we give you thanks this day for your presence amongst us, even when we feel alone, especially when we feel alone. Glorious and all-powerful Lord, we give you thanks that your power is made manifest in the world in the hands of medical folk, doctors and nurses, who are learning how to care in the face of a disease that no one knows what to do with. Give them wisdom and strength and learning so that they might make the best decisions for us that seek to heal us. Gracious and all-powerful Lord, we ask that you would rain down your wisdom upon those in authority over us, that they might work together to make good decisions that are in the best interest of your people, all of your people. Grant them grace and strength so that in working together we can know your peace in the world and wellness once again. Good and gracious Lord, Take care of your earth. Take care of your earth where we failed and teach us to do better. Help us to be stewards of the things that you've given us so that your world might provide for us everything that we need as you've intended. Give us grace to help with a helping hand in all those things that you'd have us do in this world. Good and gracious Lord, we ask most especially that you help us to understand that we are servants one of the other that we are your servants, we're your hands and feet in the world and called upon to be the voice of love and the voice of healing and the voice of acceptance for those who are outside, those who feel alienated, ostracized, hated by the world. Help us to be the ones who proclaim your love to them. Help us to be the ones to reach out in love to them so that your will might be made manifest in all people. Gracious and all-powerful Lord, we give you thanks for the resurrection, for raising Lazarus, for raising us, and for helping us not only to know that at the end of time our bodies will be raised again to glory, but helping us to know most especially that because of you, because of everything that you've done, because of you, we have life right here, right now, in the face of all the challenges, all the difficulties, and all the fear. Grant us grace, Lord, to embrace what it is that you've done for us, not seeking our own wisdom, our own way, or our own solutions, but yours. Help us to remember that you are the resurrection and the life. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Lord, in your kingdom, Lord, Lord rather, remember us in your kingdom and teach us all to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give each and every one of you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you once again for joining us this morning. And it is my prayer that the Lord is with you for this entire week. And more importantly, because I know he is, that you know it too. That you 
go on with your activities in life in the confidence that God is present to you every single moment. And that in that confidence, you can share God's love to the whole world. Hope to see you at devotions tomorrow night, maybe at the check-in time tomorrow afternoon, and certainly at worship next Sunday morning. God bless one and all. God bless and have a good week.